So uh, I'd like to again welcome Claire Gray to give her presentation on niobium based anode materials. Claire. Thank you very much for the invitation and thank you for all coming back um, to listen to me. So what I was asked by CBMM was to be the, the last person in this session to really talk about some of the details of the chemistry. And this is the chemistry that was really started by a former PhD student in my lab, Kent Griffith, and now six or seven years ago, where we came across these classes of materials, niobium tungsten oxides, with very fast charging rates. But I wanted to step back a little bit and think about uh, how one looks for fast charging in, in materials. And if you look on the um, anode side, or in any material in general, you really want to try and find materials that have large voids in the structures, okay. and ones, um, where you would have high lithium mobility because of this. And for people like myself as solid state chemists, one of the obvious materials to look at are perovskites, or so-called rhenium trioxide structures, which are like a perovskite unit, except there's no cation in the center, so in principle, you've got a very large space to allow the lithium ions to move within. But one of the problems you have with this type of structure is that if the cation is not the right size for the, the center void, the units will rotate and they'll clamp the anion, sorry, the cations in place. And this is an example of the lithium re reunite structure where you actually don't get very fast lithium transport through the tunnels. Um, and so just to be clear, I'm not proposing we all start looking at rhenium as a, a new battery material. I'm just illustrating this as a structural motif. But so if you start thinking about that, you then have to move into chemistries where you can stop this rotation of the units and keep the tunnels open so that the lithiums can move um, freely as you start to fill more and more lithium in the structure. Now, one way you can do this in a perovskite unit is via the so-called shearing of, of the units, so that instead of having corner sharing units, which is shown here, you might have um, an edge share unit. And so this is shown now looking down on an, a plane of uh, perovskite units. So each of these squares is an octahedron. If you shear them, you can see you generate these edge sharing units. And you can do this in two directions, and that then forms the blocks that are present in the H form of niobium oxide. And what that does is it gives you structural rigidity to the framework so these types of distortions are no longer possible as you insert lithium into the material. So just to um, think a little bit more about that in the niobium space, uh, these block structures, um, which derive from the shears, are part of a large family of so-called wadsley roth phases. And even in niobium, you can see, depending on the ratio of the oxygen to the niobium, or the um, oxidation state of the niobium five, um, sorry, the niobium from five plus down to more reduced compounds, you can get compounds with a whole variety of block sizes. And so just to sort of illustrate that, um, these are the various compounds. And so this is, for example, a phase where you have a three by four block unit. Um, and depending on the, um, the, ox the oxidation state and the oxygen content, you accommodate the loss of oxygen by the formation of these different blocks. So that's one way that you can um, keep these octahedra intact and prevent these rotations. Another way you can do this is via the so-called bronze phases. And so these are another class of materials which are again um, derived from the rhenium trioxide structure. So here is this same um, plane of uh, octahedra. And instead of shearing, now what you do is a rotation. And so just keep your eye on this and then move over to this structure. And you can see all you've done is rotated it round um, by, by 45 degrees. And then you've created this uh, disordered or um, different arrangement in the AB plane. And that's the basis of a bronze phase, which is um, illustrated by the low temperature phase or T phase of NB205, where T stands for T for low temperature. And so this again is another way of holding these units intact when you lithiate them. And so just to remind people who are not niobium experts that even NB205 illustrates this massive um, structural polymorphism. And so this was the first study done by Kent Griffith uh, now um, six years ago 
sorry, well, you started six years ago, published four years ago, where you publish, um, where you, sorry, you heat up the niobium-4 compound that adopts the Rutile structure. You go through the T phase, the B or thrombic phase, and finally to the H phase at higher temperatures. And you go from the bronze phase through to a TI2B structure or related to that to the H phase at the highest temperature. And so what Kent did was to show that even um, with these very large particles that you generated from um, of the, the T phases and the H phases from the NBO2, NBO2 structure, you were able to get very high rates, uh, even when the particles were more than one to three microns. Uh, and so this is an illustration of the T phase here, where you can see that even at 10 C, we're getting very respectable capacity retention. And most of this capacity loss is not due to the material itself, but rather the IR drops associated with the external circuit, the, the contact with the current collector, and also the lithium metal, which we showed separately by um, looking at the impedance from the lithium metal plating. And so this is now a comparison of the different materials. The, the B phase and the NBO2, NBO2 don't have a very good um, open tunnel structure, so they have very bad electrochemistry, but both the T phases, the, the the TT, which is the very low phase, and the one the next phase up, have um, good electrochemistry, and the H phase uh, also has a slightly higher capacity. And so this is just to contrast and to remind me to say that a lot of this work was inspired by a beautiful work of Bruce Dunn and his co-workers, where they made a series of hierarchical structures, uh, the, the mesoscale structures, where you get even higher rates. But what we wanted to emphasize was that the materials intrinsically have very good lithium ion conductivity. And so what this motivated then was work by Kent to explore essentially every single combination of titanium, of niobium with other elements. And so he looked at the titanium phases, he looked at the, the tungsten phases, he looked at some of the molybdenum phases to really identify which systems had the highest ionic transport. And um, I'm not expecting everyone to be able to read the complex phase diagrams, but just to take away from the way the fact that it's a very complex phase diagram of many different materials. So what in the end uh, we came across were the two optimum structures, the NB16W5, w which is a block structure, and a composition uh, with a similar niobium to tungsten ratio, which then adopts the, the bronze structure. And you can see that the syntheses again yield very large particles of five to 10 microns in length. And we were able to get, despite the particle sizes, very respectable performance at high rates. And so this is showing you that the, the block phase uh, where even at 20 C you've retained um, more than 50% of the capacity. And this is um, data showing this more clearly here as a function of C rate. So at 20 C, we are over 150 milliampers per gram um, and similar performance for the, the bronze phase. And I'd like to, it, to emphasize that these are not optimized electrodes. They haven't been calendared. Um, while we've made some effort to look at the current collectors, there's a lot more space and improvement than shown in these original data. So what we wanted to do in terms from an academic perspective, again, was to unpick and understand why these materials work so well. And so one of the ways that's used uh, to measure lithium ion transport often is the so-called pulse field gradient NMR approach. And typically you see it used uh, uh, ionic conductivities in, solution, in solutions, so a liquid electrolyte, or sometimes in solid electrolytes where the materials are diamagnetic. And that's a practical NMR perspective because um, it turns out that unless your lithium spins uh, are, don't relax uh, or they can live for long enough, and from an NMR perspective, you can't actually make this measurement. But because these materials were such good lithium ion conductors, we were still able to do lithium PFG measurements at, um, at slightly elevated temperatures and then extract um, diffusion coefficients and activation barriers by measuring lithium transport as a function of temperature. And so just to sort of illustrate how this is done, this is a typical uh, PFG measure. What you do is you apply an NMR pulse sequence, and then you apply gradients um, in the beginning and the end. And what a gradient does is it, um, it maps out or changes the chemical shift of the lithium spins depending on where it is in the material. 
And if during the waiting time the lithium ions move, the signal disappears. And by quantifying the loss of or the change in signal as a function of either gradient strength or in terms of the spacings or the time you wait, you can extract this diffusion coefficient. So these are exceptionally high lithium um, diffusivities, but I want to just put these in context by comparing numbers determined also with pulse field grad gradient methods with some of the best uh, solid state electrolytes. And so the best in class are really these sulfur-based systems um, originally developed by Professor Cano's group. And then there are the, the nasicons and the garnet structures. And all of these materials have diffusion coefficients in the regions of 10 to the minus 12 to 10 to the minus 13. And that's exactly where our materials are. And they have similar activation barriers. But you can see that we're two to three orders of magnitude better than graphites and spinels such as the LTO and the LMO, which represent some of the best in class of the cathode materials. And of course, the LTO was discussed, discussed in the last talk and by ABB. So then let's reflect and put these diffusion coefficients into context. And so what I wanted to do was to think about the diffusion coefficients. And so these are in meters squared per um, second. Often you see these in centimeters squared. So just um, bear that in mind. A typical liquid electrolyte is 10 to the minus 10 to minus 12. So we're, um, you know, we're sort of one order of magnitude slower. Um, but still, let's reflect on what happens if you charge your battery in a 1C. So if you um, if you if you if you take an hour charge, then uh, if you have a diffusion coefficient of 10 to the minus 12, you can move at about 150 microns. And so if you are an NWO particle, you would be able to um, move about 100 microns in a fast charge of, uh, in, in a one C charge. But if you're at LTO, you'd be looking at a 10 micron um, charge. Uh, movement that you could move in the particle. And so what that gives you a sense of is how fast you can charge these systems, relying on the intrinsic conductivity of the materials themselves and not having to nano size. And so if you want a 20 C ch charge, you're really having to reduce the particle sizes of LTO, but the NWOs will survive uh, and be capable of charging fast, uh, even at the 20 C and 60 C charge. The, the rate limitations in these materials is not the transport in the materials themselves. It's rather it's getting the lithium to the particles and also um, any additional resistance that you have, uh, particularly at the, 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 the current collector materials interface. Um, so that was encouraging to us. So we then wanted to go on and understand the way these materials operate in a little bit more detail. So we did some very detailed diffraction studies, and this is on the for the the um, block structure, the N NW16 tungsten 5 material. And what you can see from diffraction is that you have a continuous solid solution throughout uh, with moderate expansions and contractions, but no um, phase changes, which might result in um, mechanical cracking of these systems. Then we did something called bond, bond valence sum analysis to work out basically where the under coordination is. And that tells you something about the lithium transport in these materials. And you can see, as you'd expect, the lithiums are likely to move down the tunnel structures and they don't want to move between the blocks. Then we um, teamed up with um, Andrew Morris, who's a colleague of mine, uh, formerly in Cambridge, now in Birmingham, and his student, John Kosa, to do DFT calculations to understand uh, the electronic structures of these materials. And they looked at these niobium oxides that I introduced at the beginning of the talks and what they showed was something quite beautiful was that if you just put the first electron into these systems, so the elegance of looking at the niobium oxide materials first is you don't have to worry about the lithium, you just worry about where the electrons get up to. And so the first electrons go into these um, so-called block orbitals where the orbitals span the whole block, uh, span the whole block. So with the niobium 22 oxygen 54 structure, has a mixture of these um, different size blocks. And the first electron goes into an orbital that spans the whole of these blocks. And interestingly, if you were to go to low temperature, those electrons would be antiferromagnetically ordered. So the, the, the practicality of this is the electron is very diffuse, which means that the lithium will not be very well connected uh, or coupled with the electron 
so that it won't be trapped by the electron, which is what you see, for example, in lithium ion phosphate. Now, if you put the next electron in, and this is illustrated by the M phase, NB12O29, and I don't expect everyone to remember all these compositions, um, the next electron goes into a broad band here, and this broad band corresponds to an overlap of the T2G orbitals down the tunnels, so looking down the plane here. And this is the overlap that's important to allow the lithium ions to move down the structures so that you can um, move the electrons down the tunnel as you move the lithiums down the tunnels. And so that then helps to explain why these materials have very good lithium ion transport. And of course, to um, explore whether the same um, results could be translated from the niobium oxygen only materials to the lithiated ones, we looked at putting one lithium into the NB205 structure. And you can see again that you get these very diffuse block-like orbitals consistent to what we'd seen in the um, structures above. And so using these DFT calculations, we could rationalize why you've got very good lithium ion mobility. So it's a structural phenomena. It's also an electronic phenomena. Okay, I just wanted to share some preliminary um, full cell data with you. Um, so this is some of the early work we've done with, um, done by Yumi Kim, um, look, combining the the NWO, this is the block phase with LFP um, because we wanted to choose a, a high rate cathode material. And you can see that combined with um, LFP, you can generate uh, respectable um, cycling rates at 10C and the capacity retention was excellent. And so this cell just stopped at a thousand cycles because we needed it for something else. And so as long as you stay above 10C, um, then, then the rate stays very high, and most of the capacity limit, uh, the rate limitations were on the cathode, not in the anode. So the impedance is, is, and the impedance rise with cycling based on three electrode cells is, is again coming from the cathode. Um, we then wanted to move to higher energy density systems, and so this is now comparing it with um, NMC six two two, higher um, voltage as, as a result of that. And again, we're getting um, good um, rate performance to 10C in these first cells that were not optimized. Uh, the drop from 10C to 20C is really, again, coming from the NMC, not from the um, NWO. Um, capacity retention, not quite as good. But again, when we pulled the, um, the cells out and we separated the anode from the cathode, most of the capacity loss was coming from the NMC 622 and not from the um, NWO. And one of the reasons for capacity loss, and of course this is a whole story in itself on why NMCs lose capacity, is at least coming from some of the cracking of the, um, the NMC62. So these are the large uh, polycrystalline samples before and after cycling. And you, so you can see some of the sort of mechanical structural degradation um, failure modes of 622 that are, that are quite common. Uh, we can see some cracking developing or visible, sorry, in the NWO materials, but we believe that's largely coming from the processing of these materials to make the electrodes because you can see the same cracks before and after cycling. So there don't, doesn't seem to be any mechanical degradation going on in these systems. Just sort of unpicking a little, what I've said a little bit more, this is the um, impedance of the material against um, NMC622. So here's the material before is the material after 300 cycles. And um, in the first instance, it doesn't look that encouraging. We've obviously got the significant increase in the charge transfer resistance. But if we pull it apart and we make symmetric cells with just the NMC and just the NWO, you can see that the large increase in the charge transfer resistance is coming from the NMC. So this is what's shown down below here, is this increase in, in the charge transfer resistance. And yes, there's a small increase on the anode side, but nowhere near as significant um, we then explored the effect of temperature, and so this is now the data for the LFP at 60 degrees and 10 degrees. And what's really nice is we get some um, beautiful stability on the LFP at both temperature ranges. And on the NWO side, sorry, the NMC side, when you go from um, room temperature to 60 degrees, you can see that we get much better um, capacity retention at high rates. And again, this is coming due to capacity 
uh, sorry, rate limitations on the um, NMC side, um, which if you go to higher temperatures are less pronounced. And again, if you go to lower temperatures are more pronounced. And I, I'd like to stress that these are results done without any optimization of the NMC uh, 622. These were electrodes taken, um, not particularly optimized for high rate. They were compromised between high rate and um, high power and, and um, energy density. So there's obviously quite a lot of work we need to do on the NMC side to um, to match with the NWO. But the NWO in its first sort of um, first uh, electrode fabrication was doing very well. So of course we we are this one of our favorite um, characterization methods. And so one of the things we wanted to look at was just the um, degradation of the 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 electrolytes, and this is the standard um, LP57 electrolyte and uh, LP30 electrolytes as well, uh, the same sort of results. Um, we see very little um, degradation, though we do see a trace amount of LEDC. And so while we need to do some more work to look at some of the, um, or explore how sensitive this material is in comparison to say the LTOs, uh, certainly because of the much lower surface area, we see in our in our at least our lab based studies uh, much less pronounced um, degradation. Okay, I want to sort of end by um, just doing a little bit of comparison of titanium niobium oxide, so the NTO or the um, TNO, which of course was um, first developed by um, John Goodenough um, a number of years ago, and now um, commercialized by um, Toshiba. So this is now you're going to be more familiar with these block structures. This is now the two by two structure. And so you can see it has much smaller blocks, but it's essentially um, the same structural motifs as these niobium oxide I've been talking about. And it has um, higher energy density because um, basically the titanium is lighter. Um, but what's interesting, at least in our hands, these are um, energy density measurements made at very low lo loading levels so we can explore the intrinsic rate performance of these materials. Um, it, it does fit very well, um, at least um, till you get to about 1.5 volts, and then the diffusion coefficient drops off dramatically, and uh, that then results also in the um, lower energy density at these higher rates. And so what we did then was to um, characterize this in more detail with NMR spectroscopy and also DFT calculations. So this is work again of Kent's, where he made lithium titanium niobates at a whole variety of different compositions. So you can see us working all the way through from lithium 0.1 to Li 5.5, titanium NB207. So a, a six, close to a six to um, two to one ratio. And what you're looking at is the lithium NMR. So this is so-called magic angle spinning. So this is the main peak and on the left and right are the so-called spinning sidebands. Now they come from the, the fact that lithium is a quadrupole nucleus and it's a measure of the distortion of, of the lithium sees in its particular environment. Now, if you have very lithi rapid lithium mobility, the environment that the lithium sees, sees is averaged out and basically you get a sharp peak with very few spinning sidebands. But as you can see, as we lithiate further, the sidebands start to develop, and that's because the lithium becomes much more rigid in these structures and it can't move, and it, you can sample the electric field gradients it feels. And so from just eyeballing this without any real understanding of what the mechanisms you're actually looking at, you can see that after about Li 1.5, the lithium mobility is decreasing dramatically, and by 5.5, it's essentially rigid on the NMR timescale in the lattice. And so that makes sense then with these um, diffusion, um, the di diffusion numbers that we were getting from GITT, where it drops off um, basically below about one point, just below 1.4, um, 1.5 to 1.4 volts in the system. And you can achieve, um, sorry, in my screen, I've got my face over this part of the slide, so I can't actually see what it says, but um, above about 200 milliampers per gram, you can see a large difference in the GITT um, and large polarization. And this is then coming from the reduced lithium mobility when you stuff more lithium into these tunnel structures. We can then do um, very careful calculations. And this was done again by John Coaster and Yian Seymour, uh, both uh, Yian being a former PhD student in my lab to look at how lithiums move in these tunnel structures. And again, you get very low transport for lithium down the tunnels, 
and across the tunnels in, in the blocks. But if you want to move between the blocks, then you get very high activation barriers. So again, the message is rapid transport down the tunnels. And the fact that you can also hop between the open tunnels here means that even if you had a blockage in one tunnel, you can, um, you can escape that blockage. And that causes a problem in LFP, uh, where essentially it's a one dimensional tunnel structure. So can we look at other blocks? This is sort of the ultimate in blocks. This is the biggest block you can get in the Niobium 18 tungsten 8 phase. This is a five by five structure. And one would think that would have the ultimate in um, performance because you have, you can go through all of these tunnels um, and you can, but you can't again move between these tunnels. And this does have good performance. Um, you can get again, just comparable rate performance in this material, but it's um, performance over multiple cycles is not as good. You start to see more degradation. And we think, or at least we hypothesize that as you put lithiums into the center of the tunnel, remember that units want to rotate to clamp the lithiums in place. You probably have more um, uh, mechanical stresses, uh, which and less effective clamping by the, the, the edge sharing units here. And so you probably end up with degradation. And so this is something we're trying to explore. Um, explore more, but ultimately the materials that I talked about before, the um the Niobium 16 phases, the um they are sort of the ultimate in terms of the um long-term stability. So where are we now? Uh, we are trying to scale up some of these uh, materials and commercialize them by a spin-out company, CVT Tech, and Sai Shiva Reddy, the um CEO and co-founder of myself and Kent, we'll talk about this in two days' time. And just to conclude, um, I hope I've shown you that uh, we were able to identify two very good materials in terms of rate performance and long-term stability, the Niobium 16 tungsten 5 phase, which is the shear phase, and the Niobium 18 tungsten, which is the bronze phase. And um, of course, these materials are heavy, but in terms of volumetric energy density, which is sort of shown schematically here, uh, we have very high performance and the results in cell, full cell data are encouraging. And um, with that, I will end by um, acknowledging my wonderful research group. This was the research group this time last year. Sadly, we weren't able to go away for a retreat this year, so we had to have a, a Zoom retreat instead. Um, the people involved were Kent, um, who really based his whole PhD around these materials and discovered them. Lauren was involved with the pulse field gradient measurements and she got that to work. She's now a professor in Columbia. Yumi Kim made the full cells and pushed that. Quentin helped with diffraction. Uh, Jong Jae also helped um, Dee Dee Winkle with the, the NMR I showed, Yarn with the DFT, and Matthew for help with um, diffraction. And Sai, Jamie, and Evan, who are the, the start, the beginning team at CBG Tech, Andrew, Camilla, and you know, Tony for their help with DFT. Um, synchrotron measurements uh, in Argo National Lab and Diamond. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Claire. As always, very thoughtful work, very careful measurements, um, and we appreciate that.